So, hello there, my name is Nick, and I like earthworms. Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the effects that earthworms have on post-industrial uh, and brownfield soils. And one of the sort of unorthodox things I'd like to start with is introducing my committee, which um, I don't think we do very often uh, in the, the defense, but just to give you an idea who has kind of shaped what you're about to see uh, and put these, the, the research into some context. Um, Klaus, as you uh, we just met, is, um, is a botanist, especially in restoration ecology and, and has done a tremendous amount of work in, in brownfields and in polluted areas. Um, Frank started uh, in 1983 at Liberty State Park and has forgotten more about Liberty State Park than any of us will ever know. Uh, it's just a tremendous resource as it pertains to liberty and the soils and the ecosystems that are there. Uh, Peter was right there, um, it was the first, one of the first scientists in North America to put pen to paper as far as the effects of non-native and invasive earthworms in the Northeast, and especially um, carbon and nitrogen cycling and, and um, changing dynamics in soil communities. And Mark Hudson, who is not with us, he's at the University of York in the UK, um, and he is probably, well, I can say it because he's not watching, uh, he's the world's foremost expert on earthworms in the soils that are contaminated with uh, metalliferous pollution. So, very, very uh, well-rounded and, and exceptionally smart committee. And I'm very uh, lucky to have them signing my paper very soon. So the first chapter uh, of my research is uh, kind of just a basis of creating a, a, a common language. Uh, and, and the chapter itself is a lot of literature research, or a, a lot of uh, literature review and, and some of the things there that I want to point out um, is the main question of this entire dissertation was can non-native earthworms improve phytoremediation in brownfields and polluted sites in the United States? So can earthworms have an impact in these kinds of areas? So brownfields are, are usually, when we think about brownfields, we think of large areas of ecological devastation. We think of places like uh, near us, the, this is a the zinc smelter in Palmerton, um, or the Bethlehem Steel, these are places that will likely never return to any kind of natural state. But more common than this are smaller areas, areas like rail yards and parking lots, areas that have small scale, finer scale contamination. <clears throat> Things like old gas stations or factories that have underground buried storage tanks that people don't even know are there. These kind of areas are a lot more numerous and a lot more important, I would argue, than the few large ones that we have. So phytoremediation as a, as a, 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 a cleanup technique um, actually was started by a Rutgers professor, um, Billy Raskin, back in the early 90s, and did a lot of that initial work. Basically, what's happening is that uh, deliberately plant different species of plants that can um, hyperaccumulate or take in a disproportionate amount of contaminants from the soil and sequester those contaminants in the plant tissue. The benefits of fiber remediation is that you, first of all, you're, it's, a, it's a cheaper, um, it's a, a, a more cost effective and, and environmentally friendly way to get rid of soil contamination as opposed to the typical digging it up, incinerating it, and landfilling it. Um, the downsides are, though, that it's, that it's very slow. It, it takes a long time to absorb those metals in there. Um, and it needs a consistent um, sort of budget for removal of those phytoremediated plants. So you go in, you, you have to harvest every year, bale the, the grasses or whatever you're using, uh, and then landfill or incinerate those. So it can be a long time and it 
requires a long-term commitment. So what we know about metals and earthworms, uh, most of it comes from Europe and Asia. Uh, they've done a tremendous amount of research in, in like, for instance, this is this uh, with mine in Kennebunian County. Um, a lot of the initial research has come out of, out of sites in and around uh, central Wales. For some reason, it's a very contaminated area. There's about 40 different papers from about 20 different authors that, that have done work in these sites. Looking at how the genetics change in the earthworms or how they um, are capable of dealing with more pollution over time uh, in, in, in subsequent generations, how long what their, how long they can last, how soon they die, all, so on and so forth. So we know a lot about earthworms in contaminated soils from research that's coming out of the UK, Western Europe, and Asia. What we don't necessarily know is what happens here. Here's why. After the last glaciation about 10,000 years ago, all the earthworms that were living in these soils were pushed very far south as a result of, of that glacier and then the subsequent tundra and permafrost. And so we end up with a kind of an earthworm free zone right around the you know, Georgia, Tennessee sort of area. And all of this now is devoid of a native, long-standing earthworm population. This leaves, the, this, this leaves that ecological niche wide open. And so earthworms that we see here today have been brought in, mostly accidentally, in shipping containers or, or in um, soil ballast from ships or in potted plants or ornamental species or whatever. Um, a lot of it actually has transferred, especially through the Midwest, through the bait industry. We see a lot of bait species uh, concentrated around high densities of fishing and lakes. Uh, so, so we're seeing these earth, the earthworms spread through these areas. And, and part of the problem is, is, is some of these species, uh, in this case, I'm going to tell you about Memphis. Uh, this is our, our local state park in Nazareth, right by, uh, right by our house. This, I took this picture in June. Look at the leaf litter that's here, okay? This picture was taken in August, two months later, of that exact same soil. What's happened is that Amenthus, in this case, um, has consumed all of that leaf litter and thereby allowing the soils to dry out. Uh, you get a lot more soil desiccation, but also you have this uh, granularization of soil and that's going to increase erosion and in contaminated areas, it would change the way that the, the, the it would change the ultimate fates of the contaminants. Because if the soil is going to run off into the nearest stream, it's going to take the lead, cadmium, zinc, whatever with it. So, so earthworms aren't always a, 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 a great thing to have in any particular ecosystem. So let's go back to the question. Can non-native earthworms improve fire remediation in brown fields and polluted sites in the United States? In order to answer that, we need to first know what's already out there. So the first study that we did was to um, collect <coughs> earthworms in both contaminated brown field sites and in non-polluted sites that had no history any kind of industrial uh, history or, or, or past. The way that we did this, there's a ton of different ways to collect earthworms. You can use electroshocking methods, you can use formaldehyde, you can, you can dig up a, a monolith of soil and sort it by hand. This is uh, the most environmentally friendly uh, and easiest to use with volunteers. It's a great outreach tool. Um, so what we did was we took 45 grams of mustard, mustard powder, a picture like Coleman's uh, mustard powder, and uh, about a gallon of water, and you allow it to steep for an hour. And what happens is the allele of isothiocyanate uh, will leach out of the mustard powder, and when you pour it on the ground, the earthworm skin gets irritated by it, and they come up to the surface in an attempt to escape the burning sensation. 
So, typical method, and, and I apologize, some of you have seen this about 300 times already, but it's a good flavor. Uh, so, you, you, when you first address the area, uh, you're going to pull back some of the leaf litter and any, um, any kind of detritus that's there. You want a nice level surface to start with. Uh, the ring that we used is exactly a quarter of a meter, so that makes the, the math a little bit easier. You push down on that ring and you pour the mustard water into the area that you're testing it, and almost instantly you'll notice that into that quadrant uh, come lots and lots of earth. Except that, that one just never comes out. <laughs> so out of this particular site, um, I ended up with about 120 per square meter. Um, the best we've ever done was 440 per square meter. I don't know if that was spot in the It was just an incredible, I mean, it looked like spaghetti coming up exciting and nauseating at the same time. Mm -hmm. So from there, they're euthanized in, in ethanol, and they're put into a long-term storage container uh, where well, they'll be identified, weighed, um, and, and processed for, for later study. The sampling locations, uh, there was 135 samples that were taken in 37 different locations. Uh, 74 of them are non-polluted sites. Those are indicated by the, the green square, the green diamonds, and the pink triangles are uh, are brownfield sites with some kind of remediation history or or industrial past. So we got about 110 kilometers of distance um, east to west, and lots and lots of samples. All of these results are given in, in the form of violin plots. Now, I want to orient you very quickly to what a violin plot is. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, if you're familiar with the, the original two-piece box plot, uh, which shows you the median, third quartile, first quartile, uh, your adjacent values, and then any outliers, right? This is the exact same thing. You've got your third quartile, first quartile, median. But here, you've got a kernel density plot, kind of like a sideways histogram to show you where the, the, the population is, is um, centered around. So here's what we found in the sites. In non-polluted earthworm samples, we had a total of 74 sites. We've got um, a mean of 42.9 earthworms per square meter. In brownfield sites, the average per square meter is 48.7. So although not st statistically significant, it still should be very surprising that we're pulling more earthworms out of contaminated soils. Even more surprising than that is the fact that the average weight of earthworms from brownfields is half of what it is in areas from non-polluted sites. So not only are there more earthworms, but they're literally half the weight, or half the size. So that was kind of an unexpected finding, and we wondered if perhaps that, that um, you know, maybe we're just pulling from ground fields in the spring before the earthworms get big, and so we're just weighing the smaller ones. So given month over month, Comparing polluted and non-polluted sites. Um, here's the lighter colored ones are the non-polluted sites. Uh, the darker color are the uh, brown fields. And you can see that all of these, this is um, the little stars here. Uh, if you're not statistically oriented, um, mean that the, the, that gives the p-value down here. And basically, what that means is is that there's a essentially a 99.999% chance that that did not happen by accident. If we look at 
total abundance, and one of the reasons that this paper is a little bit different than other earthworm studies that have been done in the past. Most of the other earthworm biosurveys are just checklists. If we found this one, we found that one, we found that one. What I did was I took a look at overall abundances and how those abundances uh, and, and what the diversity looks like in all of these sites. So we had a total of 1,538 earthworms. Out of those, um, you know, 743 in ground fields, 795 in non-polluted areas, and by far and away, the most common species that we found was amenthus. We're going to talk a little bit more about amenthus as we go along. Um, the, the juvenile lumbricus is uh, kind of a problem to identify the difference between lumbricus rubellus and lumbricus terrestris unless they're um, sexually mature adults. So if they weren't mature, we had to kind of label them uh, juveniles of, of the lumbricus family. That was as close as we could get. Um, so our main species we get, and we end up with lumbricus terrestris, lumbricus rubellus, and amenthus. If I did a temporal distribution of when we found those percentages, you would see that, that you know, in, in April, we have a lot of smaller earthworms. Unidentifiable earthworms are, are ones that uh, they weren't uh, patellic yet. They didn't have any setae yet. They uh, were unidentifiable without some kind of DNA analysis. Though, as those earthworms start to grow up, they become more and more identifiable, so that number goes down. Some earthworms only come out in the springtime. Those earthworms then, as the summer goes on, as soils dry out, temperatures rise, they actually will go into what's called an obligatory diapause. And will go way down deep, curl up in a ball, and, and effectively hibernate throughout the summer. And then there's others that, for instance, a Memphis here, will die in the fall after laying eggs. And then in the spring, the eggs hatch, and they grow, and they um, expand and take over certain areas. We also looked at a canonical correspondence analysis of, uh, of the earthworms. And um, one of the things I really like about this is, is how, once you can read it, the, 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 it makes a, a whole lot of sense. This is uh, pretty cool. Imagine that the length of the arrow is the relative importance of the factor. The direction that the arrow is going in is, is showing you basically a, a gradient that's, op, that's perpendicular to those arrows. So imagine the contour lines right here. I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. But the nearness of the, uh, of the, the species dot there tells you which factor was the most important to that particular species. So, for instance, if, uh, if we added those contour lines here for later months, all right, so the latest month we had is September. This is the line for August, this is the line for July, this is the line for June, right? Uh, and what it shows is that, for instance, um, Aparecidia species and other, the, those unidentifiable ones were only found earlier on in the year. Whereas Memphis, remember back to the, the previous line plot, was only found in late, later in the summertime. Primarily found later in the summertime. It also helps when we look at wetter soils, it's exactly opposite of later months and higher soil temps. So those two factors are directly opposite of each other because obviously wetter soils happen in the spring. Right? And as soils warm up, it happens to be later in the year. So it's a good way to kind of double check your work and make sure that, that this all makes sense. Um, one of the binary factors that we had was to say it's either a ground field or it's not polluted. Earthworms that were found in both types of sites are somewhere in between those two contours. And the species are based off of, these are all the sites. Uh, the ones with little crosses mean that Amethyst wasn't found there. The relative size of the circle tells you how many there were in that area. And then the average is, is where the, the little star
star is here. We took that average, and what ultimately you can do with the CCA plot is to say that Memphis is most likely to be found in forests and fields later in the summer when soils near pH 7 are drier and warmer in both polluted ground fields and non-polluted sites. And so it's indicative of what we're finding and where we're finding. So we know what is where, and we know how much of what is where. But can they make a difference in overall growth? And so the next step was to look at uh, quantifying a habitat amelioration with earthworms and with hyperaccumulating plants. And so the, the, the experimental design looked like this. There was 60 total, use five gallon buckets, um, 60 total buckets, half of them had earthworms, and half did not. And I'll tell you about those colors in just a second. But the soils come from Liberty State Park, and Liberty State Park has a great story and a great history with it. Um, back in the, this is 1854, to orient you a little bit, this is, uh, this is Ellis Island right here. Bedloes Island was later renamed Liberty Island. Battery Park in Manhattan. And all of this was called Community Park. Over time, it was filled in and became one of the largest uh, railroad terminals in the Northeast. All of what you see here, that map ended right in here, the previous map. This is all filled. It's all filled from construction, debris, and, and soils from Manhattan and Jersey City. And um, in 1967, the railroad terminal closed um, and it became a state park. But what happened is, is all of the outer areas were cleaned up. The interior portion of 102 hectares was left because that's where the most contamination was. So this is where the main railroad tracks were and this is where the spills from, from rail cars and things like that would, would contaminate in a, in a very patchy kind of way um, the, the soils that were there. So, we collected the soils, and uh, I can't get too close here. Um, we collected the soils, we screened them, homogenized them, mixed everything together, and put them into five gallon buckets. Then, I created three pollution gradients. I took soil from Home Depot, clean topsoil, Um, yeah, I'm not sponsored by Home Depot. Um, so I took soil from Home Depot that was low pollution, and I had the high level of pollution soil from Liberty State Park, and then I created a medium level of pollution by mixing those two together 50 50. All of those buckets with all three soil treatments got seeds. Half of them got earthworms, and it was replicated 10 times. The, the seeds that I chose to use uh, were Phagopyra mescalentum, or buckwheat, uh, and Cephal cereal, which is rye. Um, and here's some of the differences, and this is why I chose two different things here, is, is buckwheat is non-mycorrhizal, so it doesn't have those symbiotic fungi living with them. Um, they have a shallow root system, they're a form, uh, they're a dicot, and they're known to clean up uh, lead and aluminum out of soils, whereas the, the sakal is uh, mycorrhizal dependent, so it needs those to those fungi to have um, proper nutrient transfer. Uh, they have a deep, extensive root system. Deep, extensive root system is an understatement. Uh, an average four-month-old rye plant has four. I'm sorry, 237 square meters of surface area of, of the roots. So it's, they're, they're pretty impressive root systems. Uh, it's a graminoid species monocot, and uh, it's known to take up arsenic, cadmium, copper, and a whole variety of other things. So planted these two things together in five gallon buckets. The earthworms that we use, here's a little word about earthworms here. This is a, a lovely drawing. Thank you. Um, Epigeic earthworms are leaf litter dwellers. So they're living, uh, these are your composting earthworms, the red wigglers, right? 
that, that uh, live in the leaf litter, they don't burrow. The endogeic species are root zone dwellers. So they are living uh, kind of in the first few centimeters in and around the shallow rooting systems of, of plants. And anisic earthworms are deep burrowing. They could have burrows to, to four meters deep. They, uh, in our case, these are the, the only anisic earthworms we have are um, Lombricus terrestris. They, they, excuse me, they live eight to nine years. Um, they live in permanent burrows, and these are the ones that migrate across the sidewalks in April. Right? This is what most people know of, of Lombricus terrestris. They're, they're, the, they're the sidewalk ones. Um, at, at the endogeic, we can kind of blend this, all these groups together, and the most common uh, sort of uh, mix that we get is at the endogeic earthworms. They live in the soil, but they consume a tremendous amount of leaf litter. Uh, these are the ones that are, are removing leaf litter and, and changing soil composition, like a Memphis does. That shot that I showed you at Jacob's work. To fill all four of those roles in each, in each of the buckets that had earthworms, uh, I, we added Perionyx excavatus, uh, which is uh, sometimes called the Malaysian blue worm. It's used as a composting earthworm, um, but they do burrow. Uh, whereas the city of Potato, or the red wiggler, or trout worm, or a whole host of other things, is why we use the, the scientific name. Um, these guys are endogenic leaf eating earthworms that are. Uh, added to the buckets, they're used for in your compost bins. Amethis is the, the kind of virulent invader that we have in, in the Northeast, and uh, Lombricus terrestris is the anisic deep burrow. So they were all added to half of the pots. And almost instantly, you can see that there's, there's already a tremendous difference from soil quality. Right? We can see just, just sort of anecdotally that, that um, before we harvested, there was already, you know, this is your low pollution, mid pollution, high pollution. So there's definitely things going on in that soil. If we looked at all the biomass of the harvested plants, once they were dry, um, what we find is that the earthworms did help the phagopyrum grow more, but it made the sacal grow less. So the question is why? Why would you? Why would? Uh, why would the sacal grow less in the presence of earthworms? So that got us thinking both about possible mechanisms for that, but also about competition between the two sets of plants. To analyze and really answer the question of why it was smaller, uh, we needed to analyze all of the metals. And so what happens is this is a very quick process that took several months and several thousand dollars to do. Um, take the sample, you weigh half a gram out, uh, well, half a gram within one one hundred thousandth of a gram. Um, you digest it in concentrated nitric acid. You take that analyte, you, you filter it out, you raise the volume up to 50 mils, and you put it through the ICP OES, or inductively coupled plasmography, uh, OES, optical emission spectroscopy. Basically, you fire a mist of that solution into a argon plasma flame at 14,500 degrees, and it picks up electron differentials and tells you what concentration is in the analyte of whatever metal or pollutant you're looking for. Here's the results of that. Earthworms had little effect on the phagopyrum, but Sakal always took up more metal in their presence. What this means is that, you know, you, you, so we have the rise over here, okay? we've got copper and arsenic. And this, this one is the, the buckwheat and the rise, so the, the phagopyrum and Sakal right here. And what you're seeing is that earthworms effectively are increasing the amount of metals that are taken in by the brine. Make sense so far? Okay. For 
the same reasons that the levels of metals are increasing in the presence of earthworms is, this, is believed to be the same reason why the growth was stunted. So they're growing smaller because they're taking in more toxins. And the reason that they're doing all of this is because of those mycorrhizal fungi. Our muscular mycorrhizal fungi, or AMF for short, um, are, are very fine fibers. We'll zoom in a little bit. All of those little hairs are the hyphae from the, the our muscular mycorrhizal. And what they're doing is they're actually acting like a filter that is protecting the, the roots. Not only is it helping nutrient transfer into the plant, but it's also protecting the plant from contaminants. If earthworms eat those little fungi, then the plants no longer protect from absorbing more contamination. In the soils, we see that the soil level of the, 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 the levels of contamination in the soil did go down. Um, we started out, for instance, this is the mid-level pollution, um, 70 with uh, what's that, 8,548 parts per million of zinc. After the test, the non-earthworm soil went down to 2,000 parts per million, but the one that had the earthworms was about 3,500 parts per million. And we see this across the board, and what that is there is that the earthworms are actually sequestering and hyperaccumulating the metals themselves. Unfortunately, it's not particularly helpful for them to do that because you're not going to let them soak up the, 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 the pollutants in the soil and then go around and pick up the earthworms. That, that's not going to help with remediation. But it does help with overall fate of the metals in the soils and how quickly they can be rinsed away or, or you know, washed from erosion or, or rainfall or something like that. So we needed to go back and answer what exactly happened in the pots and make sure that it wasn't a factor of the buckwheat and the rye together were competing and that's why one grew larger than the other. So this time, we, I doubled the study uh, and created 120 pots. One had phagopyrum, one had sacom. It was the exact same experimental design. It was soil from this time. Lows. It, they, they took that, the, the clean soils, the polluted screen soils from Liberty State Park, and then a 50-50 mix of the two. Room for the same amount of time in the greenhouse at Moravian College. Next, Moravian. And unfortunately, they only grew 10% as large as they did the previous summer. Next, Moravian. So, I'm kidding, really have nothing to do with your greenhouse. Um, but what we did find was that the earthworms have a highly significant impact when tested um, with an ANOVA, which looks at the analysis of variance over all of, of the, the, the trials. We'll get to that in just a second. What you see here is that, um, for instance, the, this is Sakal. Um, the, the, the rye did get bigger, all right? And the buckwheat did get bigger in non polluted soils when earthworms were present. If I look at all of the um, ANOVA results, the ANOVA was based off of, of you know, what has the bigger difference? Is it pollution? Does pollution give us a big difference in growth? Or does earthworms give us a big difference in growth? Or do both of them together, interacting together? give us a high uh, difference. And so what we see here is that, uh, obviously, there's a significant difference in biomass, arsenic, copper, lead, and zinc when it comes to pollution level in both. I hope so. That's a good thing. But here, when it comes to just earthworms, can the analysis of variance be explained in part by earthworm presence? Yes. Do see that. And it's more significant with rye. So if it's more significant with rye, that brings us back to our original conclusions from chapter three, which is that it has a lot to do with that mycorrhizal 
relationship there. So, to bring it all together, all our firms, all the chapters together, this is if you've been sleeping for the last half hour, here, here's your catch up time. All our firms were pushed far south during the last ice age, and the native species haven't all entirely returned yet. There are native species living in and around uh, the Northeast, but they've been moved uh, anthropogenically too, just like the invasive ones have been. Surveys for earthworms uh, can indicate species composition. They can help explain what is where, and uh, statistical analysis uh, like the CCA is not necessarily a recipe for, you know, if you find this spot on the, on the matrix, you're going to find that worm right there. It doesn't work that way. But it is indicative of the types of factors that we need to look for for a particular species and what they, what they prefer. Primary earthworms that we found were Lumbricus terrestris, Lamanthus agrestis, and uh, Lumbricus rubellus. We know that earthworms can help increase plant biomass, especially in non-polluted areas. We saw that in, in chapter three in the buckets and also in the greenhouse and the pots. They can reduce plant growth by encouraging plants to increase toxic intake. So not only do earthworms help the plants grow larger in clean soils, but they can actually reduce plant growth in polluted soils by encouraging them to take in more pollutants. Plants that have large root fiber systems, 237 square meters in a four month old plant, obligate mycorrhizal relationships and have the ability to hyperaccumulate those metals, are going to be impacted most by anisic earthworms, deep burrowing ones, that are going down deep enough to really consume the mycorrhizal fungi that are on the roots. And the big one, the answer to our question, as much as we can tell right now, is that non-native earthworms like Lumbricus terrestris can improve fiber mediation in ground field soils. Earthworms like Amethys can cause a loss of leaf litter, they can cause erosion, and they can cause undesirable metal veins in these areas. So if you're looking to clean up an area, this is, this is the caveat of the entire thing. In a situation like Liberty State Park, if there was a desire to fiber remediate, you could go plant the plant something like Sakal, and you could encourage earthworm growth, and it would help the plants take up more. You could go in, harvest it, bale it, get rid of it. That would be a fine mixture. That would be a fine management. But in areas like Palmerton, you're dealing with mountaintops that can't be mowed. Tractors can't go up on the side of the mountain. They receded it with, with airplanes. So in a case like that, what they wanted to do was sequester the metals in the soil and build an organic top over it. In that kind of situation, you want to go out of your way to avoid plants that are mycorrhizal dependent if there's earthworms there on the mountain. So it depends on what your management strategy really is. Uh, but overall, this is, is what's happening. So we can see a difference in earthworms. We can see a difference in, in growth in plants and how much metal they're taking in, um, especially when some of these factors are met. So I'd like to thank a whole bunch of people. Um, this is, um, you know, thanks to Rutgers. It's been very swell for me. Um, the Garden Club of America has been really swell to me in, uh, in, in the form of several grants. Uh, Moravian College was really, really swell to me. The Cary Institute was very, very swell. Uh, I would move up there a month every winter and do all that testing. Uh, and especially the thank you to the Saskatchewan Western Board, who when I called to ask about the strength of the allele isothiocyanate in their mustard, they were like, we have no idea what you're talking about. How about we send you a 50 pound bag and you figure it out for us? <laughs> and the next day, a 50 pound bag, it was like they overnighted this gigantic sack of, of mustard powder. 
um, and especially to uh, the cohort and, and my parents and Klaus and Hadas and, and Marsha and uh, Kyle did a lot of the work with, with the roots and um, the type of photosynthesis that was happening. Um, Rita and Omar did a, a huge amount of the earthworm sampling, uh, as did Kathleen, my mom there helping me sort the soil out, but most especially to the two beautiful people in the middle of this picture who, if all goes well today, I'll be a doctor, but Jen will always have more patients. <laughs> I've been waiting years to make that film. <laughs> so, I will now answer your questions. Okay, thanks for coming by. <laughs> So, um, to test it, we had, when I ran through the ICP, it had normal levels, average background levels of, of metal contamination. Um, In fact, I just um, put something up on our, our Weber soil testing lab Facebook page about those bags.
which is totally unheard of. Normal soil, by comparison, is, is two to three-ish. Here in New Jersey, it's yeah, two to three percent. So the fact that we had 30 percent carbon in the, in the Liberty Park soils really threw us for a loop. So yeah, there was, there was plenty of carbon for them. Right, probably not a whole lot of nutrition.